we'll continue our series on word search. We started on last week. And when we talk about word search, of course, we are speaking about choosing one word to focus on and act on this year, or for this quarter, rather, choosing one word. On last week, if you were here, we asked that you would prayerfully think about your one word, just one word, not for a year, not for six months, just for three months, one quarter. Actually, it'd be 78 days if you started yesterday. It'd be 78 days, one word. You also have a card that you were given as you walked in, or you just use your comment card. We'd like for you to write down your word or phrase, and then deposit it as you exit into the baskets that'll be there anonymously. Don't put your name on it. We just want to see what words congregation is choosing. Again, as you exit, you can drop that in and do it anonymously if you choose to participate. So let me recapitulate these seven things that will help you and me be successful in our one word or phrase resolution for the first quarter of this year. These seven things uh, we talked about last time. Let me quickly recapitulate them. I think they're on the board for you. Yes, they are. Number one, choose an achievable goal with a timeline. Just choose an achievable goal with a timeline. Don't over-promise and under-deliver. I'm not going to go to the gym six days a week, 5 a.m. every morning. No, just choose something achievable and do a timeline. Well, our timeline is the next 78 days. Secondly, research it. Research it. Who's already doing what you want to do? There are people who are succeeding every day at what I'm failing at. How are they doing it? So research it, read about it, find an example, and learn from them. Thirdly, write it down. Write it down. We remember 40% more when we write things down consistently. So just write it down somewhere, and then put it in a visible place. Put it in a visible place, not social media. Put it in a visible place. You can put it on a mirror, on a refrigerator. You can put it at work or uh, in your car. Just put it in a visible place as a reminder. And then expect to what? Wake up the person next to you. Tell them this is a, not just a monologue. This is a dialogue, all right? Expect to what? But then restart. Expect to fail and restart. And then reveal it to at least two other people. Reveal it to two other people for accountability. And then last, chart your progress. Chart your progress or your, or your regress. Speaking of regress, here is my chart for... If it's blank, that means it was great. Let me move on to the next point then. <laughs> ah, okay. Let's see. Uh-huh. I blew it. On that day, I blew it. On that day, I really blew it yesterday. I had <laughs> now now cut me a little slack. All right, cut me a little slack. Somebody say, why did you say 70%? Well, quite candidly, 70% gives me two cheat days, okay? <laughs> it gives me two cheat days. I'm gonna get better as the time goes on, but that is how I charted. I want to, my goal is to have no X's up there whatsoever the next week that I show you this chart. Amen? Eli, you preaching next week, right? <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Some of you will catch that on the way home. Well, today, I want to talk about intentionality. Intentionality. This word, intentionality. And the intentionality of God the Father in creating the church, 
and Hope Church's intention to strive to follow what he has created, although imperfectly. Intentionality. I want to look at the book of Acts and how God intentionally created the church. We read this. Now, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Now, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven residing in Jerusalem. When this sound occurred, the crowd gathered and was in confusion because each one heard them speaking in his own language, completely baffled. They said, on all these who are speaking Galileans, that is, they did not learn this language, and how is it that each of us hear them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and the province of Asia, of Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Serene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, that would be Gentiles who converted over Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own languages about the great deeds God has done. All were astounded and greatly confused, saying to one another, what does this mean? And the apostle Peter says, but this is the thing that was spoken of to the prophet Joel, that in the last days it will be. God says that I will pour out my spirit upon all people. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see vision. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. Intentionality. How God intentionally created his church and how we as a congregation seek to live in that intention albeit imperfectly. Here's the sermon in a sentence. Intentionality is a mental or biblical attitude resulting in deliberate action. That's what intentionality is. It's an attitude, a mental or biblical attitude, but results in deliberate action. My question for me and you is, can intentionality be your word in 2024. Can I be more intentional about something in 2024? Now, if that's not your word, you have not chosen it, it's only for those who may not have chosen a word. But I want to look at the intentionality of God and his church. God the Father was intentional about the birth date of the church. He was intentional about the birth date of the church. And um, there we go. We can clear that. The birth date of the church. Now when the day of Pentecost was come. It was no accident that God brought the Spirit of God on those people in Jerusalem on that day. The birth date of the church. The day of Pentecost. That Greek word means 50. It means 50. Uh, Pentecost. It is the same understanding of the Hebrew word Shavuot, which means seven weeks. Now, this will make sense in a minute. Because when the Israelites left Egypt and they had the Passover, that was a bitter moment. Seven weeks later, let's see, seven times seven equals how much? Ah, seven times seven is 49, 50. And so in the Old Testament, Shavuot was seven weeks plus one day after Passover. Pentecost was 50 days after the crucifixion. Then you had the resurrection. When Jesus rose from the dead, he stayed on earth for 40 days. He told his disciples to go and reside in Jerusalem for 10 more days. He had 50 in mind. And then the harvest of the Holy Spirit fell and the church was born. It was very intentional, no accident that this happened just on that day, the birth date of the church. And so after crucifixion, 
resurrection, and then the harvest of the Holy Spirit. God the Father intentionally created the church on the day of Pentecost. He knew that all of these people would be coming back in town for the Jewish feast, and he wanted to arrest their attention to tell them about the good deeds of God and Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And God gave to the world a birthday gift called the church. And what a gift the church has been to the world. He has given us this gift, this beacon of light in a bastion of darkness. He's given us the birthday gift of the church, an antidote of hope in a world of poison. He has given us the birthday, birthday gift of the church, a force for good among the force for greed. And it has been blessing people for 2,000 years years. It's his birthday gift to the world, and therefore we are his gift to the world as well. Now, look at the bottom of your um, bulletin. Do you see I have a challenge there? And what does the challenge say? Write the name of 10 friends, all right? I know you can walk and chew bubble gum at the same time, so you can be thinking of 10 friends, writing their names down while I'm going through points two and three and four till we get there, all right? Are you tracking with me? The birth date of the church was intentional, and then when God created the church, he intentionally made it a diverse blend, a diverse blend. Blend. When God created the church, he intentionally made it a diverse blend. We just read these 17 plus nations, young people, men and women, all this diverse blend were hearing the good deeds of God in their own languages. I'll read it again. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya near Serene, visitors uh, from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, that's any other Gentile, and Cretan and Arabs, we all hear them speaking in our own language is about the great deeds God has done. Listen, and in those last days, he will pour out his spirit, that's what Joel says, upon how many people? All people, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. <clears throat> Even on my servant, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy a diverse blend, an ethnic blend, a gender blend, an age blend. God created the church, an economic blend. He always intended it to be that way. We are the ones who blew it. We blew it because of our humanness, racism, and theological arguments over various biblical passages called Baptists and Pris Episcopalians and Presbyterians and Methodists and Church of Christ and Lutherans and Pentecostals and black churches, white churches, brown churches, Asian churches. It was never God's intention for that. It was always his intention to have a diverse blend. Now, I'm not speaking against those churches. What I'm saying is in God's ideal scheme in the kingdom, he never intended that to be a Jewish church and a Gentile church or a black church or a white church. He always intended to be just the church in whatever locale you were in. That's an adverse blend. I've told you before, I'll tell you again. It really does not matter if you're black or white, yellow or brown, rich or poor, up or down, male or female, suburbanite or urbanite, Republican or Democrat, liberal, conservative, hawk or dove, as long as Jesus Christ is the center and circumference, the sum and substance, the basis and boundary of all that we ever hope to be, we can have a diverse blend of unity. That's a good place to say amen. That was his intention. Here's the third one. The church was always intended to have a discipleship bend, a discipleship bend. 
Don't lose me. A discipleship bend. Matthew 28 says this, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. That is, ethnos or ethnicity. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then leave them alone. No? No. And then it says to do what? Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. A discipleship bend. Go is what we call evangelism. Make disciples is what we call discipleship. God never intended to separate the two. We have, but he hasn't. We have, but he hasn't. Go evangelism. Make disciples. That is discipleship. Let me give you a simple working definition that has blessed me across the years of discipleship. Someone shared it with me. It's finding a person who knows less about life and the Lord than you do and teaching them in word and deed. That's it. That's what he intends for us to do. Find someone who knows less about the Lord, less about life than you do, and teach them in word and deed. He always intended for us to make disciples. Let me give you a second thing that he intended for us to do, Acts 1, 8. But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, so you're not doing this on your own. You've got to have power from above. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the farthest parts of the earth. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, local. Farthest parts of the earth, global. God intended for us to make disciples of every ethnicity, first local and then global. It's important that we get the order right. And then here's the third one. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law was given by Moses. He didn't do away with that. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So we'll be a church of grace and a great a church of truth. We're not one or the other. We're both and. Did you not know that you could be a church that is unfriendly to the unchurched and still be discipleship-minded as well? God has always intended his church to be both and, not either or. That's why it's very important when we talk about our mission and our pillars. It's designed to be both and, not just either or. You know, if you are just a person of grace, then that means you're permissive. Uh, it means that you're wishy-washy, you are unaccountable. If you're a person of just truth, that means you're brutal, you're judgmental, uh, you're harsh, you're self-righteous. No, Jesus came to bring us grace and truth. And the church must be both and, not either or. We can be Jesus-centered, unchurch-friendly, and discipleship-minded all at the same time. That was his intention. That's why we say with our mission, we want to engage our unchurched neighbors of every age and ethnicity to experience Jesus. To engage our unchurched neighbors, that is grace of every age and every ethnicity that is intergenerational and multi-ethnic. And to experience Jesus, that is truth or discipleship. Now, our goal is not to be an intergenerational church. Our goal is not to be a multi-ethnic church. Our goal is to be a church of intergeneration and multi-ethnicity that helps people experience Jesus. He's the goal. And if he's the goal, then look, you like me know, for those of you who have surrendered to the Lordship of Christ, if we could ever get our people to understand him, it'll make all the difference in the world. And that's why we say, get involved in worship, community, service, and generosity. We have those pillars posted throughout because to the extent that you get involved in more than one of those is to the extent that you will experience the peace and power and purpose of Christ in your life. That's what his intent was. 
That was his intent. So we have to walk the messy middle. We have to walk that spiritual balance. Isn't it easy just to be around people who look like you, vote like you, talk like you? Isn't it? It's easier. But we have to walk the messy middle. We have to be a church of grace and a church of truth. Both and. That's what God intended. Now, you working on those names? Are you working on them? I'm going somewhere. You can chew bubble gum and walk at the same time. You can listen to this sermon and be thinking of your names at the same time. You writing them down? All right. Here's the last one. Here's the last one. God's intention was the birth date of the church. It was on purpose. He gave a birthday gift to the church. And his intention was to be a diverse blend and to have a discipleship bend. And then lastly, to have the ultimate end in the church. That's victory, his ultimate end. Listen to what Revelation 1 and 7 says. Look, he is returning in the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, those who have not surrendered to him. They, they, this will certainly come to pass. Amen. I am Alpha and Omega, says the Lord, the one who is, who was, and who is still to come, the all-powerful, the birthday gift that God gave to the world called the church will never, ever in. It will always be one that is victorious, and he's going to come back and receive us to ourselves. Our government may change, but the church will never end. No matter what kind of government we have, it'll never end. That's our ultimate end. Well, here's my challenge for you. Have you been writing your names down? All right, you may have to finish it when you get home, but I want you to ask yourself four questions. Four questions. You got your names? Number one, how many of those names uh, are unchurched? How many are unchurched? If you're like me, my temptation is to surround myself with other Jesus followers, and I'll look at my friends and hardly have anybody who's unchurched, all right? How many of them are of a different age? If you're older like some people in here, then how many are 35 and younger? If you're younger, how many are 55 and higher? age. Then how many of them are of a different ethnicity? How many of a different ethnicity? And then the last one. How many of them are hope members or friends of hope? I mean, how can we be a melting congregation if all your friends are outside of hope? Now, you know how to make these numbers, these percentages change? This is my challenge for you this week. Intentionality. Intentionality. It's not going to happen automatically. If I want to improve my list and have more unchurched friends, it's got to be intentional. More people of different ages, it has to be intentional. More people of different ethnicity, it has to be intentional. More people who are members of hope or friends of hope, it has to be intentional. Did that make sense? All right. Let's pray together. Indeed, our Father, we thank you for your intentionality. In fact, you you came to this earth intentionally to rescue, deliver us intentionally. And now we pray that you would help us to be more intentional in our own lives. Help us to be a church of grace and truth that navigates the messy middle. Help us to be Jesus-centered, unchurch-friendly, 
and yet discipleship-minded. We thank you for your intentionality. Help us surround ourselves with new friends who are different so that we can display to them in word and deed the good news of Jesus Christ. It's in your name we pray. In fact, we praise you for the ultimate end of the church victory. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. We love to pray for you and celebrate alongside you. Please share anything going on in your life with us at HopeChurchMemphis.com slash prayer and subscribe to the Hope Church Memphis YouTube channel to experience previous worship services and more. Have a great week.